the 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 coolest thing for me about participating and seeing all these people with different disabilities just just like how amazing each person's story is to get them to be competing at this elite level um given what they likely had to go through um whether it was uh limb loss for me my limb loss was congenital so i was born without the leg um, but other people have traumatic limb loss they are uh wounded warriors um so just like the fact that given a disability uh you're at a dis bit of a disadvantage when you go to participate in sport because you maybe you need adaptive equipment or maybe you need special training or supervision and so to see people competing at the highest level of the sport is just remarkable This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpre, skincare for athletes. Whether you're in the gym, on the mats, on the road, or in the pool, we protect your skin so you're more comfortable in your own body. To learn more, go to solpre.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today is a certified personal trainer, uh, but that's just the start of it. He's also a PhD student in rehabilitation sciences. And he participated in the Paralympic swim trials. Welcome to the show, Travis Pollan. Thanks for having me on, Jesse. So, Travis, before we got going, Travis and I were go. We, we've been talking probably for about fifteen minutes now, and I'm like, all right, we need to stop <laughs> so we can actually get going with the real thing. Um, so, Travis, back me up and everybody else a, a little bit. We were talking about um, your. So you have a background in swimming, and you, you did the Paralympic trials. Kind of, I guess. Let's back up a second and re-explain what we were just talking about, and we'll catch everybody up and continue with our conversation. Sure. So, so I tried out for the Paralympics in 2012 in swimming, um, and I was talking about a little bit how uh, the the classification system works uh, in swimming, which I know best, um, but there are classes in all various Paralympic sports, and how the participants are selected to go on to compete in the Paralympics and how that sort of compares to the Olympic Games. Um, and I, like, I was just basically the, the, the coolest thing for me about participating and seeing all these people with different disabilities, just, just like how amazing each person's story is to get them to be competing at this elite level, um, given what they likely had to go through. Um, whether it was uh, limb loss. For me, my limb loss was congenital, so I was born without the leg, um, but other people have traumatic limb loss. They are uh, wounded warriors. Um, so just like the fact that given a disability, uh, you're at a bit, of, a bit of a disadvantage when you go to participate in sport because you maybe you need adaptive equipment or maybe you need special training or supervision. And so to see people competing at the highest level of the sport is just remarkable. Yeah. So and I was, I was telling Travis about my coach who coaches a Paralympic athlete who was in the Olympics this last time, um, Sean Morelli, she's a cyclist. And if you want to know more about Sean, you can go back to episode one where I talked to my coach and we talk a little bit about Sean there um, and kind of her whole story. But yeah, she's a wounded warrior and kind of came to cycling after you know, being honorably discharged from the military uh, and went on to, spoiler alert, win gold medal in Rio. Uh, but yeah, her story was really, really great. So it's like people come to the Paralympics from all, I'll say all different walks of life, but all different kinds of scenarios. So it's like everybody has their own story and things to overcome. And I think Travis, that's what you're saying. It's just like, the, you know, in Sean's case, she isn't physically disabled, but um, she does have some kind of mental condition. And I, I just don't recall what my coach had mentioned um, that she has to deal with that, you know, as you mentioned, leaves people more apt to be sedentary because there are more hurdles to overcome. You know, think about the average American who's overweight and there's nothing technically wrong with most of them. Whereas, okay, now you don't have a limb, there's extra equipment you need. And I don't mean this in a, I mean this in an empathetic way, but I know that going from running, which is basically put, 
put some shoes on and head out the door to triathlon, which is like gather all your shit. You have a bike and you have all this equipment. You've got to, it's, it's such a pain. It's, it's a super pain. So I can only imagine like having to have equipment no matter what to go be active. So yeah. That, or it's a mental hurdle. Yeah. Or even like, so I started rock climbing a few years ago and I just did my first adaptive competition a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago. And that's another one where per- personally I'm able to just hop on the wall. Um, yeah. I actually, I don't even use my prosthesis for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, just feel more comfortable without it. Of course you need rock climbing shoes or shoe in my case for that. Um, but other people who I was competing against, um, they don't, they can't take ground falls. So it was a bouldering competition. So there were with bouldering, there are no ropes and the maximum height is maybe 14 feet. Mm-hmm. Um, but for some of these people who are participating, um, they aren't able to tolerate jumping off of the wall, uh, that you can climb down if you're able to, but you don't, you don't always plan when you're going to fall. Right. So anyway, they, for each of the routes, you could opt to boulder as normal without a harness, or they had ropes available. Mm -hmm. Um, but the point is if you don't take ground falls, then you always need someone to belay you. Yeah. And so now which is always true in um, top rope climbing. You right. always need a second person, which is why I prefer bouldering because I can just get up and go. Right. Uh, but that's a, a good instance where like somebody who is missing a leg but can't jump off the wall, now they can't just get up and go rock climb because they need somebody to go with them, uh, which is fine. You know, it's, it's a collaborative and community-based sport. Um, but it's not as simple as I just want to go out for a run, right? Just need to lace up my shoes and go. Uh, there are other, you know, hurdles equipment wise and, uh, just people wise that are needed. Right. I think that's something that I, I know I certainly take that for granted sometimes. I mean, we are as humans, I believe we're social creatures though. I'm, fairly introverted and independent. So I spend a lot of time by myself and doing my own thing. And that's kind of what I want to do. But I know that, you know, in that situation, especially it it forces you to have, you know, somebody else to do the thing you want to do. I mean, in a more mundane scenario, you think about, so I've been able to post post collegially continue to compete and do my thing because it's an individual effort, but you know, the the guys that play football or play soccer or any of the team sports no longer have a team to do your thing. I think, yeah, I think that's really like a huge uh, hurdle to overcome after, let's say you played in college, after you graduate college, um, maybe you can find a rec soccer league um, Mm -hmm. to play in, or uh, I don't know what other sports I'm sure they're playing basketball, but yeah, yeah, yeah. they're not going to find a rec football league, at least not contact, right. uh, might find flag and maybe that's enough. But I, I often think, I think that's why former athletes often will flock to CrossFit because mm-hmm. it's an, it's like an example of, okay, we have that community element. We have the competitive element because we're mm-hmm. racing the clock. And that is missing from a lot of people's lives once they leave the system that made it so easy to engage in their physical activity with their community. Yeah. And well, and it, to, to me, too, is it's a sense of identity. It's not just it's like th- this is who I am. And it could be, you know, say I like I have a friend who um, he, was, he played soccer in college and he eventually transitioned to triathlon, but he played. Um, I think he played in USL and he wanted to make it to MLS and he just didn't quite make it. And so he had to do this identity transition from soccer player to triathlete. Um, and I know he had trouble with that. Plus there's like physical adaptations and it goes from this very team activity to hours and hours and hours of very intense activity by yourself in isolation so not only are you dealing with the physical changes you're dealing with the the mental changes and that you know that all comes together both for the average athlete and then for you know anybody that's dependent on somebody else to go do their thing you know yeah and it he it's awesome that he found triathlon because a lot of people will i guess not just not see that as an option 
And mm -hmm. frankly, it's not a great option because it is individual. And if you really do love that team aspect, um, then you're not going to have that, right? Yeah. Um, I remember when I was doing my master's degree, a friend of mine, his name is Dan Feeney, he was like a national level triathlon, triathlete. Um, but he had come from uh, mostly a track background or cross country. Mm -hmm. And the, at the university, the team had been uh, next. And so he was having to do a lot of his training on his own now. Um, and so like very infrequently, he would ask me to come and swim with him. Yeah. I knew that when he was asking me to, it was because he was really desperate for just somebody to go through, like not that I could keep up with them by any stretch of the imagination, but just for somebody to go through a couple hours of training with him, given that he was training 20 hours a week on his own in the winter, sometimes yeah. in the cold, yep. walking, uh, of course, swimming inside. But um, the, the individual aspect of that, I, I really saw that in him, like just the amount of stick to it it takes relative to like yeah swimming is an individual sport but the rest of the team is there if they're working hard i'm gonna work hard too um and that's just a different uh dynamic than when you are on a team like a football team soccer team basketball team whatever yeah the only solace we kind of had and this is where i, I met kevin is we were kind of part of this uh development pipeline trying to get college athletes and turn them into pro triathletes yeah i kind of snuck my way in i always i always say i'm very fortunate to have been there since i didn't really make the so like the it, there's qualifying standards basically to get the free coaching like for full-time coaching i kind of had part-time coaching from uh barb linkos to his former pro and um stanford all-american swimmer and blah blah, blah lots of great things she was in charge of this program at the time so we we got together at nationals and a couple other like high profile races during the year, like amateur races. And that definitely helped the sense of like community and team. Cause it's like, we're all here and we can kind of, you know, talk during the year. Like um, Todd Buckingham, who I've had on the show twice episodes, I think three and 29, he's from that group. Um, and so like Todd lives in Michigan, Kevin lives in Cleveland, like we're all across the U.S. So none of us, well, I guess one girl actually does live here in Kansas City with me. But um, for the most part, we're all spread out, but we could still have some semblance of team. And then I think we all, at least I felt this way, going to these high profile events and then we would do camps or clinics before and after the race with Barb. And it was definitely like, back in college, like this intense training, we're all together. It's like you immediately click cause you're all doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, and if by chance anybody is a collegiate athlete that wants to turn pro, um, that group is now run by, um, Olympic triathlete, Joe Malloy. Barb has moved on, but, um, Google it. It's, it's, <laughs> Joe's great too. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something to miss where you don't, you don't have those, yeah and you can so you can foster those communities online um to keep up with people and commiserate uh share training tips but of course it's not the same as going out each day and training with training partners yeah so in, in your case i have i have no cost so just treat me like i'm an idiot i have no concept of like should like your speed in the pool versus i'll say an, you know a non-paralympic athlete like, are you training at the same speed? Um, are you, you know, just swimming out with a regular swim team and then you go to yeah. a different trial? Or? Well, so this, this is something that I get asked a lot. I, like, for a little while, I was the disability or diversity uh, like chairperson for Mid-Atlantic Swimming. And so I would get parents emailing me, like, how I have a kid with disability. Um, what are the resources for them? And so I could first share my experience, which was right. that um, I started swimming my sophomore year of high school. So I actually got kind of a late start competitively. I swam in my neighbor's pool since I was a little kid. But yeah. um, when I started, I was very slow, mm -hmm. um, like anybody who's never swam laps before for yeah. you know, 
couple hours at a time. Um, but over the period of a high school season, I became somewhat competitive with my able-bodied teammates. Mm -hmm. Um, and by my third season, I was, I wouldn't say I was like very, well, I, I was the second, I think the second or third fastest backstroker on the team. Mm -hmm. Um, so like I wasn't, I wasn't breaking school records, um, but I was competitive in meets and I was scoring right. points. Right. When I got to college, uh, I swam division three. And so I didn't score any points in college meets. Uh, mm -hmm. I was slower than the, com the competition, but I was my, like, my speed was akin to the fastest females on the team okay. or, the, or, or on the women's team. So yeah. like my hundred freestyle was competitive with the top women's hundred freestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my best event, 50 and hundred free. Um, so from that standpoint, I was able to keep up in practice with the regular team. Um, I was not the slowest person, but I wasn't close to the fastest person either. When we would use a pull buoy and paddles, I was the fastest person because right. I, I wasn't kicking anyway, and I was super strong in my upper body. Yeah. Um, so that's I, that's sort of where I that like the men and women on, in my college team, we all trained together because we had right. a ten lane pool. Yeah. Um, so I like I was fi able to find people who I could like work off of and try to race in the pool. And maybe it was a, a male swimmer, maybe it was a female swimmer. Um, but I know for other adaptive athletes. Uh, let's say you, I don't know, my, like my disability classification is class nine out of 10. So mm -hmm. the classification 10 would be like um, minor weakness in one limb. Maybe you're missing a hand or maybe you have a club foot. So I'm one tier down. Um, there were, there were certainly adaptive swimmers who I saw at Paralympic trials who were not swimming. Like if, if, if the best swimmers on my college team were here and I was here, then people, you know, maybe you're missing both arms and your stroke is a dolphin kick. That's right. going to be, that might necessitate that you're not doing hundreds, uh, hundred repeats on the 120 or 130. You're just right. not, right. you don't have the limb power for that. Right. So right. Um, for kids who are uh, like they're, they're either one, their ability isn't there yet to swim with the, um, the same, you know, the people who are their age, who are not disabled, um, then they have to find other resources, right? Like maybe a team with a lot of lane space can afford to give a lane to somebody like that. Mm -hmm. um, but also now they're needing like a special training program, um, a, a coach who's training that lane separately from everybody else. So it's, right. it's a challenge. And I think and all, like, I think the best case scenario is that you can get that person onto like in a, in an environment where there are other people, their age or close to their age who are training, even if they're doing something slightly different. Um, mm -hmm. But that it's not always practical in a six lane pool with, I don't know, 40 other people. Yeah. It was like 30, 40. Just... Yeah. To accommodate this person who's not even on the same, just, just on a, in, in a different part of their training and physical development than everybody else. So, you know, when, when parents would email me, I would, I would try to just explain that, um, and make those suggestions. I, I think, yeah. I think there, there's often, you know, parents are looking for coaches with, uh, experience working with adaptive athletes and that that's great. But I, I think most coaches can probably figure it out. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you have to, get experience to have experience, right? So right. if the coach is willing to work with somebody like that, then awesome. It's just, it is tough when the lane space and resources aren't available.